This is CUNY TV, the television station of the greatest urban university in the world. As the sun sets at the end of a New York workday, the mind transitions from daily tasks to the cloudier, more philosophical regions of social issues, culture, and politics. In a democracy, every perspective on the world is important, and people in art and culture have surprising bodies of knowledge that can shed fresh light on today's reality. The following conversations with journalist and filmmaker Jean Combe de la Loire and artist Sarah Bremen took place at that time of the day. Jean Combe de la Loire is a Swiss journalist and documentary filmmaker based in Brooklyn, New York. His films, many of which are made in Latin America, examine poverty, immigration, and human rights abuses such as kidnapping and community violence. How did you end up getting involved in Latin American subjects in particular? It's a long story that I'm going to try to keep it short. Um, uh, so I studied as a journalist in Switzerland and I came uh, from a very rich country where a lot of people wanted to come to and I grew up with kids um, who were born from foreign parents uh, but like I, grew, I went to school with them and uh, I was Swiss and they were not. And I always like kept this idea of immigration in my head. Like I don't know, I felt like privileged and I didn't understand as a kid why I was so privileged to have this Swiss passport. And so I came here and like I was sent here as a journalist to cover the US news, covering uh, first George W. Bush, then uh, Obama, and life was good, but like, you know, I was missing something. And then the the earthquake in Haiti happened. Uh, I went there the next day and uh, I got the biggest kick in the face of my life, you know, like uh, I didn't expect that and, and I did stories that were incredibly powerful, you know, like um, you know, spending a day with a, a, a man who was trying to dig his own brother from the rubble and then digging him out and then not having the money to bury him, so putting him in a white linen and like leaving him on the side of the street. And so these stories, for well, the people who read them, pretty amazing. Uh, and my, my editors were saying, yeah, that's incredible stuff, mm -hmm. good job. And then when I came back here, I was like hammered. And I, was re I started really questioning my job as a journalist, like what impact do I make? So I decided to focus on South America because I felt like, okay, uh, I can sell all the stories I want in the US. People are always gonna be interested in what's going on here. What about places like Guatemala, or Nicaragua, like Honduras, you know? You Where spoke Spanish already? I kind of learned it, like I learned it in 2006 covering Chavez and the elections in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to go to these places and there was this show on Sw Swiss Public Radio that was amazing, that gave you the opportunity to do five half hour radio stories, and so like, like This American Life. And so that's what I'm starting doing, uh, these radio stories in Central America, talking about kidnappings, about, you know, like a, a lot about immigration, because I had this passion for immigration, like trying to understand why people would decide to leave everything behind and, and go up north, you know, like pay thousands of dollars to try to reach the Huge US. risk, and you don't know yeah. if it's going to work out. Yeah, exactly. And so that's how I started doing it. and. Then I started like working on films, you know, and uh, did the film in Nicaragua and then uh, another one in Guatemala, which were part of the, you know, kind of the sequels of radio stories I'd done. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it started and now it became my main trade. So let's start maybe with By My Side, the one in Nicaragua. Um, how do you find the subjects for your films? I'm sure it's different in every case, but... Yeah, it is. <laughs> I was doing this series uh, in, of stories for the radio in, in Nicaragua, and so one thing that was there um, was a huge landfill, the, the biggest in Central America. And so when I went there, in there, like uh, you find the keys. So when you say, I'm saying finding the keys, you find the people that can take you in mm -hmm. because you, you're still a gringo, you know, you cannot show up. And, and so you, you get in and you meet people who give you their time. They have nothing, you know, they, they're looking for food, they're looking for stuff in the rubble, like in the, in the trash. And then they just take time. And you know, for, for them, time means something. It means food, it means soap at the end of the day that they can't buy. It means frijoles, like the beans, you know, they can't buy. 
The more time they spend with you, the less money they're going to get at the end of the day because they're looking for aluminium and all this, and, and they put them in these huge bags. And so I, I was doing this, and I met this girl who was uh, like a little bird, you know, like like a little injured bird in, in this landfill. That's a uh, Dominga. Dominga. Yeah, and so she took me on the ride with her. And so I followed her for a year, and I did a film. From this, I got the chance to do another film, uh, and that's how the, the ball started rolling. Do you have a way to try to keep some distance? I mean, it seems like you might want to intervene and help people in a certain way. There's a whole debate in journalism right now about people just standing by and filming it and not actually jumping in and, you know, saving a life or whatever, but... Um, that's, that's a big... That's a big question, and they, it, it, happened, it happens every time, and that at some point you have to let the story go. In the end, I'm still a journalist, so a journalist, I'm, I'm very lucky to be able to be the eyes of the people, you know, that are going to watch my films or read my stories, and, but then the eyes, you know, you have to let, I, I cannot act at some point, you know, you have to, you know, to pass on to somebody else who, who can do something. When I was in Mexico, I was doing a story on, on La Bestia. It's the train that takes the, the migrants up north. And I was shooting there and the kid fell. And he lost his left, leg, left arm and left leg. So first, as a journalist, you ask yourself, what are you going to do? Are you going to film or are you going to help out? Mm -hmm. For, uh, so I made the choice to film. So that's a f big decision. Second big decision is like, when you edit the film, are you going to show? the arm and the leg and that were severed or not. In the end, we decided to show because like as a journalist, to make an impact really like, like a punch to try to get people to act. Also, it's also my way of trying to counter all, all the falsehoods and all everything that's wrong, being said about immigration, that's yeah. wrong. <laughs> that's just because by people who don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, no, I was, I was struck in watching La Prenda, the, the pawn, mm -hmm. the story about um, young girls who are being kidnapped, raped, you know, horrible, killed, horrible stories, that there was so much border crossing going on. You know, the family of the, the murdered girl has to leave the country, so they cross over into the U.S. for some time before they can come back because they they would be threatened by you know the killers um i realize how little i know about the wall physically and and how or the fence or the border let's let's call it more precisely if you had some sort of you know fantasy um role to play where you could you know sarah huckabee sanders is taking the day off and you're allowed to go out and actually speak to the american people about what's going on in terms of the crisis like what what would you actually say well, I would try to bring Astrid with me, uh, and Astrid, she was the, the main protagonist in La Prenda, and she's a very shy young woman. She had, she's not a militant, you know, right now there's a lot of, in the media, there's a lot of me, people who, who can talk very loud, and, you know, that's how usually the louder you are, the more people are usually going to listen to you. With the people who are really willing to listen to her, and to her, uh, like, soft voice and say, okay, li listen to what she has to say. Listen to what she has had to go through. And, uh, you know, like, coming to the U.S. for her was not a choice. It was a necessity. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying, like, everybody is in her case, but, like, what I'm saying is, like, usually the people who decide to make the trek up north, first, they, they arrived here after a very difficult journey with a lot of debts mm -hmm. uh, and just one phone number or two if they're very lucky mm -hmm. and they're gonna be watching behind their back for the next 10 years so it's not it's you don't come here like just because for the fun or for the but you really it's a lot of time a question of survival mm -hmm. and um, that's what I would explain uh, to, to the and these and these are not you know bloodthirsty criminal Mexicans who are just looking to sell drugs and take advantage of American culture, which is the way they're characterized by this yeah, I've, administration, unfortunately. I've covered the uh, gangs in, in Central America yeah. and Honduras. And yeah, you can see, I mean, even people who don't know what they're talking about, uh, you can see them, you can spot them fairly easy, yeah. but usually they, they have tattoos, teardrops, they have like, like La Vida Loca, like little tattoos. No, it's not. I mean, I'm not saying they're none. I'm, what I'm saying is like, 
usually the, the vast majority of them is people who have made a decision to come here um, for a lot, sometimes for economical re reasons. But they, you know, if they came here, it's because they had to. Well, I think your films, one thing I've noticed in the three I've seen, um, you focus really on the most vulnerable people. I mean, I think The Pawn, I mean, that title alone proclaims that this is a vulnerable class of person who can be sort of exploited very easily. We could just as easily be talking about, you know, rich Russians or Chinese or Indians, you know, um, taking American jobs or, or, you know, doing all kinds of things. But Latin America, these people are easy to sort of criminalize and, and make fun of. A bully will look for easy prey. Yeah. And it's a very easy prey. Going back to some of the gang type things and maybe we could bring up Stray Bull, the film you filmed in Patterson, New Jersey. You're interviewing some pretty tough characters, and I imagine, first of all, it's hard to get into those situations, but second of all, how, how do you deal with that just personally in those situations? Do you try to disappear? Do you have to gain their trust? I mean, what are you doing during those uh, interviews? It's always the, kind of the same thing. Uh, in, in Stray Bull, it, it took me a year and a half to, you know, you stand there on the street corner with them, and you see what's going on, you know, and you see a lot of things. Uh, usually the white guys like me, they're not here to make films. They're either to arrest or to buy drugs, uh, like literally. And you see, like, you have to gain the trust. You have to see, like, they have to understand that you're not uh, you're gonna work for the police. Once you get to that point, once you get to the story, then you have to make sure that you will not do anything that will harm them either because they give their story they give you their trust they give you know that that was the deal with them you say you speak on camera uh, and me i'm going to tell you a story and we did a, a screening in patterson with like all the sides of the film like so you had some cops you had the lawyers you had the family of the victim you had some gang members and they were all in the same cinema well, I think one of the most powerful scenes in the film is when the, f the father of the victim is in the waiting yeah. room talking to the mother of one of the accused and they actually find they have things in common, they can be sympathetic toward each other. To try to understand how ready society was to deal with a drama like this, a tragedy yeah. like this. A little girl who goes home on a scooter at 6 p.m. in the streets of Patterson who gets shot and so they arrest three guys. The scene you're mentioning, to me, they're teaching us a lesson of in humanity, you know, in like re resilience. And so, yeah. and yes, they are worn down, but like at the same time, you know, they're ready to to listen to each other. Regardless of the verdict, it seems like there's no finality to it for almost yeah. everyone involved, right? There's none. Yeah. Absolutely none. When you know, wherever this film goes afterwards, if you reach that, if you reach that point, and if you're able to, then portray these people and, they, and communicate their story the way they would have probably tried to do it, mm -hmm. then, then you did something right. You're raising kids here. Yeah. Um, do you think about moving back to Switzerland or will there be a right time to do that? Funny story about this. The, the night he was elected, I was covering it uh, here. I'd been working like crazy. I was exhausted. I'd been covering for this campaign for a year and a half. And with my wife, you know, who is also, she's Brazilian and Swiss, we, we had discussed that, like, if he gets elected, we're going to leave, you know? 2 a.m., you know, like, he, he was getting elected. Um, I saw people, like, crying just down the street. Mm -hmm. I cried myself, in a way, like, of exhaustion. And so next morning, my, my son goes to school, like, his teacher is crying. So we, like, like literally, like, and we're like, what are we going to do? So instead of going back, we decided to become Americans and vote. And so that's what we did. My kids, Leon is 12, Josephine is nine. They're Americans. You know, they correct my English. They grew up here. They're New Yorkers. And um, so why would uh, I leave because of what's happening in Washington? I'm trying to change on my own scale, going back for me would be going back to a different life. And New York like, made me grow up and, and made me do films. So there's no way. <laughs> Jean Comte de la most recent film, Stray Bullet, was released in 2018 and is available on Netflix. He is currently producing two new documentaries, one about soccer hooligans in Argentina and a second shot in New Jersey following one of the characters from Stray Bullet.
So Abramen is an artist who lives and works in Brooklyn, New York, and Amherst, Massachusetts. Her distinct sculptures, assembled from found objects such as stray chairs, camper shells, chunks of wood, and tinted glass, conjure both the complex view of domestic life and a sense of revelation. You have one of the more interesting backstories of any artist I know. Your mother built the house that you grew up in. Can you talk about that? My mom um, had a was a carpenter in training in, I think, in the early 70s. There were programs to get women into different trades and... In Massachusetts? In Massachusetts, yeah. We were living in Northampton, Mass. And um, she was a single mom and doing different jobs to support us. And then she kind of self-taught, and I think it was through this training that she um, started to do carpentry work with a couple of her girlfriends, and mm -hmm. they did jobs in the area, and they slowly learned how to be carpenters. And then she bought a tobacco barn and took it down and used all, and, and I think it was a really cheap way to get materials. Mm -hmm. So she used all the wood for the tobacco barn and some of the beams to build a lot of the house. Mm -hmm. And she bought a piece of land up in Ashfield, Massachusetts, which is where I grew up. Her brother was training as an architect and they designed the house together and she built it. I think I was probably around five years old. So you're not old enough to pick up a hammer and help? Oh, we were hammering, but not helping on the house. She would just give us like scraps of wood and uh -huh. stuff and nails and we could, mm -hmm. you know, play. I do think that it also gave me this feeling of, oh, you can build whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I remember having this, being really confused about why my mom wouldn't want us just to paint like big huge flowers all over the outside of the house <laughs> because this is our like you're building it you can do it whatever right. you want don't you want to do that mom mm -hmm. like why wouldn't you want to mm -hmm. just like paint all over it just like some normal kid would pick out their wallpaper for their room or something yeah, like that but um, yours wasn't store-bought it was uh homemade yeah homemade and was pretty inspiring and your work seems to me to look like this this picture I have of your mom building the house. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 she did, she, I mean, she salvaged, I remember we would go, she would go, like a lot of the windows were <clears throat> from salvage yards and mm -hmm. she got this really beautiful stained glass frieze that was in our kitchen mm. um, and just kind of pieced it together. When you were in art school, were you doing radically different work than you do now? Or was it all, always pretty much found objects, combined? Was it always sculpture? It was always sculpture and a lot of found objects. Mm -hmm. um, in grad school, I I'm, did started working with tents and like sewing tents together. So I guess mm -hmm. there was always kind of this architectural. And I liked working large. I found that out. I've just always liked that, mm -hmm. like moving big things around. And even the tents. I like the fact that I could work pretty easily with these large, right. I could get these large volume just with this very lightweight thing that could also just be put in a bag. It would kind of all fold up and put in a bag and could be shipped. Do you and your um, husband and kids actually go camping or is that just a motif in your work? No, we do, We're not as much as we'd like. I mean, I grew up camping a lot. We're not like avid campers, but we like it and we go when we can. So you've lived in rural places as well as New York City your whole life pretty much and I guess my question would be are you more immersed in your rural community? Do you have friendships? Do you talk about politics with people? Well I guess there's a, I grew up in Ashfield which is rural mm -hmm. um, but I live in Amherst now so it's college town yeah, it's a an college, exception. It's a college town. It's not very densely populated but it, it doesn't it's not the same as like where I grew up, which is only 20, mm -hmm. 20 miles away. Mm -hmm. We don't have deep discussions about politics. We more, it's more of a, we bring it up, kind of, not joking, but we kind of keep it kind of light, but we, you know, I'll bring certain things up with them yeah. that are in current affairs. But I feel I have no idea what my moral obligation is, if there is one in that situation or in that relationship. Mm -hmm. I don't have any idea of what I'm supposed to say, you know, but the only thing I feel clear about is that I value the relationship. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't do anything to, to derail it. It's uh Yeah, I mean, if push came to shove, I mean, right. I would tell, speak my truth or sure. whatever, and I have, but mm -hmm. it hasn't fouled things up. What I find I is there's a decency still. I think that's the thing that I find 
su almost surprising but gratifying that there's still a decency between people who who pretty much know or suspect that they have differing political views, which is not the decency that's not existent in public affairs, like yeah. the the nastiness of yeah. the, the language, the name calling, all of that stuff. But in face to face with people, you know, in in your community, I feel like most people just wouldn't go there to, yeah. to say something so rude to somebody, which is what our politicians tend to do now. I feel like almost more responsible to be like a human being mm -hmm. and show my flaws, but also be decent. I feel like both sides have become so radicalized in a way. Um, and, and I never thought of if I was a moderate or not, but I do think that it is a country where half the people, you know, want things one way and half the people seemingly want things another way. And I think that I think that both sides really have to respect the other side in that. You have to actually honor the fact that there are a lot of people who, who want, you know, laissez-faire capitalism and no money for social issues, or in, and, there are, and that's okay, you know, that, that that's one vision. And I think as long as there isn't just rampant cheating, which is what yeah. it feels to me is most prevalent right now. Having to acknowledge at least like whatever the pain is or the, the mm -hmm. experience of the other side, and as long as that is paired with constant agitation, mm -hmm. like there have to be, we have to still be agitating. Yeah. Like that's not, you know, <laughs> and mm -hmm. I don't know how those two things can mm -hmm. exist, but it feels like both of those can exist. I wanted to ask you a question. You go to the transfer station, the dump yeah. a lot, which is where you get probably some of the found objects in your work. Uh, what, uh, I mean, what's the process like of finding something and actually making a work of art with that? It's kind of just collecting stuff and uh, having it hang around for the most part. Mm -hmm. Occasionally I go out looking for something, like mm -hmm. when I cut up the trailer or the camper, I went looking for a, kind of a relatively specific mm -hmm something without a chassis, so I wanted a truck, one that fit in the bed, mm -hmm. bed of a truck. Um, but mostly it's just, I mean, sometimes I'll just take, take stuff from our house, like if I need a chair or something. <laughs> and I know we have, and most of those just came from junk shops or mm -hmm. Salvation Army anyway, so it's not like. I guess I want to ask you what junk means, you know, I mean, what does it mean in your work? And, and of course it isn't junk in the work, but it's, um, these are references to domestic life and uh, I think the tinted glass in particular feels to me like that references something spiritual or mystical or something like that. Do you think consciously about these kinds of things? Um, not, maybe it would be easier not to at talk all, about. Not yeah. at all consciously, yeah. but definitely in retrospect mm -hmm. I can think about those things or you know when I'm pulling back a little bit. But I think my experience of making is getting as far away from consciousness as I can mm -hmm. so it's more intuitive which I think is pretty common for a lot of artists. You have your own gallery you've had a gallery for how many years with your husband? Uh, we've Canada there's there's yeah four partners were oh. open since I think we opened in 99 or 2000. Yeah and that seems like kind of an unusual relationship for an artist to have to be <laughs> the artist and the gallery at the same time. Uh, I know so many artists especially young ones, if you talk to students, their their question is, how do I get a gallery? And they're actually in some ways terrified. Oh yeah, I mean, it's totally challenging and interesting and mm. um, compelling. And it's really my, it, my husband, Phil, who basically said like, come on, let's do this. <laughs> and it wasn't with absolutely zero commercial um, intent. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just was, let's, Basically, I think he felt like he could see groups of artists that were closely linked and you kind of come to New York and get plucked apart, kind of set against each other in a way. He valued the community and the group enough to say like, hey, let's do this, let's just stick together basically right, is yeah. what, the, what the thing was. It was very much like a clubhouse feel, mm -hmm. you know, that exchange that artists have in studio with each other is a really, mm -hmm. I think it's a really beautiful and valuable and precious thing mm -hmm. and it's hard to get that anywhere else. It's, it's built into the structure of owning a gallery mm -hmm. so that's the great thing is that you still wind up um, in and out of studios and in conversation with these you know amazing artists about their work. Having a young child does that did that impact the way you works because I've seen this picture of your studio with all of these 
brightly colored objects, which is what your work is, and then this child in the middle of it, it looks like a perfect Montessori school or something like that. Being a parent is just such a gift, regardless of art, no art, whatever. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, I do feel like you want to be your best for your kids, and they've certainly seen me at my worst, and they've that I mean, they've seen me obviously my most at my vo most vulnerable self, mm -hmm. and that's okay too. Like I want that to be able to be part of our relationship, mm -hmm. but there's another part where it it just I want to be my best mm -hmm. self for them, mm -hmm. and I think that that does translate to the sculpture. Actually, mm -hmm. you know, I want to make the work that could maybe touch them. A solo show of Sarah Brennan's work is on view at Mitchell Innes and Nash in New York until April 6th. And she's part of a two women show with Ellen Birkenblit titled True Blue Mirror at the McElroy Foundation for the Arts in San Francisco through May 5th. <laughs>